Good morning, everyone. There has been an alarming rise in breast cancer cases among women under 50. A recent study shows an almost 8% increase in diagnosed cases over the 10 years to 2019. Pre breast cancer is the second most common cancer in women in the United States and the second most common cause of cancer death for American women. Kristen Ruffini talked to a 38 year old woman who had a shocking diagnosis and how it nearly went undetected. Do you see any birds right now? Stephanie Gerard is many things. A grad student, a mother, a new homeowner. What was a bigger shock to the system, the actual chemo or the fact that you were having to have it at 38? I think probably having to have it at 38. Now, she's also a woman with cancer. You look in the mirror and you're like so sad and so depressed that you're, you're losing your hair. And then on the flip side, you're like, what is hair? Who cares? All I care about is life. I want to live. I want to watch my daughter grow up. Gerard has a family history of breast cancer and a genetic mutation that puts her at higher risk. For more than a year, she says she also had persistent pain in her left armpit and breasts. Doctors ran annual sonograms, even in breast MRI, but found nothing. They always said, you don't need a mammogram until 40. No mammogram, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. They've said it's normal. My doctor said cancer doesn't hurt. In May, she saw a new doctor who ordered a mammogram, which came back positive for low-stage breast cancer. If you feel like you're being dismissed, bring a family member. Bring a friend whose entire job is to advocate for you to say, you know, hold on. So you needed the mammogram. So you needed the mammogram. She also needed a double mastectomy. Following the procedure and subsequent tissue testing, Gerard's cancer was upgraded to stage 2 ductal carcinoma. She now needs chemo and radiation. If there is something in the back of your mind telling you this is not right, then you have to push for it any way that you can get that test. Whatever it takes, she says, to be around, to watch your kids grow up. Christina Ruffini, CBS News. And Stephanie gets her third round of chemo next week. Her doctors will rescan her in a couple of months to see how the treatment is working. She says she's hopeful and looking forward to spending the holidays with her family and is also excited to get back to grad school in January. So this is the leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States. We're talking about lung cancer and this week the American Cancer Society released new guidelines for lung cancer screenings. The organization is now recommending nearly 5 million more adults who smoke or used to smoke be tested. Mandy Gaither has a look at the updated guidance. It's a potentially deadly disease. Lung cancer kills more people in the U.S. than colon, breast, and prostate cancers combined. But early detection can save lives. Only about 5% of those that are eligible for lung cancer screening actually are being screened. Previously, the recommendation was for anyone between the ages of 50 to 80 with at least a 20 pack per year smoking history who currently smoke cigarettes or quit within the past 15 years to be screened annually for lung cancer. But the American Cancer Society is now advising doctors to remove that time since quit criteria. What we found was that it, while there was initially sort of a decrease or leveling of, of a risk of lung cancer, as a patient ages, their risk of lung cancer increases significantly. Dr. William Dayhut says this update will make it easier to know who should be screened for lung cancer. People don't have to sort of calculate when someone quits smoking. And, and by, by changing our guidelines, we're actually going to increase the number of eligible patients by about 37% and which means by about 5 million more Americans will now be eligible for lung cancer screening. The screening is a quick low-dose CT scan of the chest since coverage is largely driven by screening recommendations from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and that agency has not currently adopted this update. Insurance may or may not cover lung cancer screenings based on this updated ACS guideline, but Day Hut hopes that will change. We're hopeful that once our guidelines are in place, people We'll look at the value of that. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. The American Cancer Society says if lung cancer is found early, the chances of being cured are really higher, and there are new drugs and treatments that can help improve chances of survival as well. All right, coming up, they spent a lifetime collecting Lincoln memorabilia. Now Frank and Virginia Williams are presenting a lecture so you can learn more about the 16th president. We'll tell you how you can participate coming up next on Mid Morning. 
All right, welcome back everyone. A lecture at Mississippi State University tonight will explore what Abraham Lincoln learned from African American troops in combat. The presenter, Dr. Susanna J. Ural, is a military historian whose books, articles, and other publications focus on Civil War soldiers and families. Her latest research explores the enlistment and experiences of soldiers who were part of the U.S. colored troops in the Mississippi Valley. Dr. Ural is joining us with a preview of tonight's discussion. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely, thank you. Let's tell people right off the bat, you will be able to get onto the campus and to the library. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Gates, gates will be up, so you'll be able to get there. All right, so tell us what people can expect tonight from this lecture. Sure, so the Frank and Virginia Williams, when they donated this collection, the idea is they just they want public, people using it, people mm -hmm. enjoying it. And so the idea of the lecture in particular is to help educate people on all sorts of aspects of Abraham Lincoln's life and about the Civil War era. You are a military historian, but you've done plenty of research and writings on Lincoln. What's the most surprising thing that you'll tell people tonight about <laughs> Lincoln? Probably, um, I think sometimes because Lincoln is so popular and so admired, mm -hmm. uh, people forget sometimes the real mistakes that he made and that the War Department made in the beginning of the use of black troops in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, part of this is about Lincoln's ability to learn mm -hmm. and how important that is for leaders to be able to recognize that we're doing something wrong, we need to change, and also how his own views change and how he grows as a leader. With the implementation of that policy, what did the country learn? What did he learn? What changes came about after that? Probably the biggest change is that there were real concerns about, you know, particularly in the Mississippi Valley where most of these men have very recently been enslaved. They're escaping mm -hmm. slavery to join the army, which is not always a place of great freedom, mm -hmm. right? And so how will these men fight? Are they going to be so enraged that there will be uncontrolled violence? Will they break and run? Mm -hmm. And so there were real concerns about how this whole experience would work. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the biggest lessons for white Americans in particular was that, number one, these soldiers did very well. Mm -hmm. And you can see this in newspapers and letters at the time as white Americans come to realize this. But also, number two, if you're willing to make sacrifices to defend the nation, with that comes citizenship mm -hmm. and a place at the table. And so for Lincoln and in the War Department, what you see is the realization that not only can African Americans handle the responsibilities of citizenship, they're exercising, they're making the sacrifices that citizens have to make. In the letters and things that you've examined, are there any personal stories that uh come to mind that might be shared tonight? Absolutely. There was a visit from uh, two free men of color from New Orleans mm -hmm. uh, with President Lincoln in the spring of 1864 as Louisiana was g gaining readmission to the Union, as Reconstruction is happening there, and as they try to convince the President, look, when Louisiana comes back in, we want to include some form of black male suffrage. Mm -hmm. And so that story is definitely in the book. And I'll be talking about, th uh, you know, this evening, some of the other things that Lincoln himself, as he thinks his way through the Even process. Even if you're not a historian and somebody who considers yourself a history buff, this is really fascinating things to listen to and, and to hear about, right? I think so. Yeah, of course you do. <laughs> no, but I do. I mean, Lincoln is such a popular president to this day, mm -hmm. and I think the Civil War is such an American experience mm -hmm. as a Civil War. And I also think uh, the reason so many of us study military history is there are really important lessons that we need to continue to learn and that, and that we should. So the collection that's there at the Grant Library will be open and people will be able to go in, is that right, after the lecture? Yes, so Chief Justice Frank Williams is here this week mm -hmm. and there'll be a reception that begins around seven right after my talk. Okay. We'll go upstairs and there's gonna be a private tour of the gallery where he'll talk about some of the items. All right, well, the lecture itself starts at six o'clock tonight, it's inside the Mitchell Memorial Library, of course, on the MSU campus inside the John Grisham Room, which is a beautiful setting there at MSU, and then the reception and the tours to follow. Thanks so much for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Coming up, drawing students to the classroom with an explosive curriculum. We'll show you where next on Mid Morning. Welcome back everyone at Texas A&M University, home of the Aggies. There's a show drawing a raucous crowd and we're not talking about football. We're talking about physics. Sherman shows, a uh, Sherman Chow that is, explains from College Station.
Aggie physics professor Tatiana Yorohimova is a force of nature. What's happening? What's happening? Kids are thrilled whether she's demonstrating liquid nitrogen or vacuum pumps on marshmallows. I'm pumping out air. No pressure from outside, same pressure from inside. She averages 50 shows a year on campus. So I need a volunteer from each row. Undergraduate students build the models and assist, all to share their love of science. An average person can go out and do this cool physics experiment, understand it, and be able to replicate it and explain it to others. They use everyday items from balloon animals to toilet paper, all hoping to inspire the next generation of physicists. One of you has to find the material that behaves as a superconductor at room temperature. Nobel Prize is guaranteed. Don't forget to send me email when you get it. She's been doing this since 2007, and it's helped recruit new Aggies. Some students who were here in middle school, I see them in my class. They tell me, do you remember me? Not really, but yes. <laughs> Energy, joy, and knowledge are infectious. We have 1.93 million subscribers on the Texas A&M Physics channel. Yeah, isn't it crazy that physics has more subscribers than Texas A&M Athletics? <laughs> it's hard not to be excited once you see all these super cool experiments. Look, no strings, Ma. <laughs> As for the kids, what are they talking about? Something that um, that's a superconductor at room temperature. I love physics. And just turned into my new favorite subject. Liquid nitrogen goes in! Because basic science can be explosive. <laughs> and rain down all kinds of new ideas. Shern Min Chow for CBS News. One invasive species is a lengthy problem in the Florida Everglades, and according to the U.S. Geological Survey, climate change is helping these predators spread farther north. Christian Benavidez goes on a python hunt. Here's how a typical night for Donna Khalil starts, and this... That is Ver Burmese python. ...is how it ends. Khalil is a python elimination specialist for the South Florida Water Management District. They're out here hunting, but you're out here hunting too. That's right, we're out here hunting the hunters. She is one of about a hundred contractors in the Everglades looking for these large invasive snakes and getting paid for it. Earlier this year, hunters snagged a 19-foot Burmese python, the longest ever measured and documented in the state. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission estimates there are currently as many as 300,000 Burmese pythons in the Everglades, with no major predator besides humans. The Burmese python has taken a toll on native species. Raccoon and possum population in the park has dropped by 99%. Marsh and cottontail rabbits, along with foxes, have effectively disappeared. Khalil says alligators have fallen prey too. You grab it, curl around it, constrict it, and kill it. Once it's dead, it will swallow it whole. It all depends on who's the bigger uh, predator. That will decide who wins the uh, wins the battle. Woohoo! Florida has been hosting an annual Python yeah. challenge with thirty thousand dollars in prices as one way to combat the growing problem. Over the last two decades, eighteen thousand of these belly crawlers have been removed, just a fraction of the python population. Cristian Benavides, CBS News, The Everglades. And the state pays hunters $50 per foot for the first four feet of the snake and $25 for each additional foot. Coming up, a chef changes culinary direction, finding favor and flavor ahead on mid-morning. Welcome back. Chef Sarah Thompson loved Italian food, but everything changed when she found herself working at one of New York's premier Mexican restaurants. She fell in love with the flavors and textures of the cuisine. Soon, she opened her own establishment, Casa Playa, and now serves up Mexican food in Las Vegas. Michelle Miller has more. At Casa Playa, the atmosphere and the offerings bring some viva to Las Vegas. Enjoy your own pastor taco with all the garnishes and salsas. It's going to be really fun. Thank you. Enjoy, guys. Okay. Chef Sarah Thompson's behind it all, where even weeknights are hopping. Tucked in the corner of Encore's casino floor,
When you walk underneath these marigolds, it's one of my favorite shots in the in the whole restaurant. It's so inviting, so warm. It's everything that you want in, in a beach house. Casa Playa is an explosion of texture, color, and taste. They're making some tortillas right now. That begins every day in a kitchen bigger than most, with ingredients sourced from farms in Mexico. This is where we mill all of our corn. The kitchen churns out up to 5,000 tortillas each night, made from scratch. And then this is the this end result. The end result, yellow corn oh, tortilla. Oh, it's warm. Yeah, fresh off the plancha. Okay, can I? Uh-huh. Okay, I'm going to do what you did. Not often in a space like Las Vegas do we see young women heading up an extraordinary, amazing space in what has, for the most part, been kind of a man's town. Indeed, indeed. But, you know, there's a, definitely a lot more female talent coming in. So it's really great to be able to pass on everything that I've learned to my all of my team, but especially the females and seeing them grow and seeing how much they've learned. It's really incredible. Born and raised in Massachusetts, Thompson's passion for food came early. I think it all started from us having home-cooked meals almost every day. My mom was uh, an avid collector of Bonat magazine. Since 1992, she's gotten every single magazine issue. And I, I loved it. I loved the flavors. I loved trying new things. I loved seeing her cook and being in the kitchen. And then it just kind of catapulted into me wanting to be a professional chef and going to culinary school, and the rest is history. After graduating from the Culinary Institute of America, Thompson went straight to New York City, landing in some prestigious kitchens like Cosme. This was three months after Cosme opened. The New York Times review that gave them three stars just came out, and I had no idea what it was. I had no idea who Enrique was, no idea who Daniela was. As in world-renowned award winners, chefs Daniela Soto Ennis and Enrique Olvera. And I just was like, okay, I need a job. Like, I'll go, I'll trail. And... <laughs> I, I loved it. You like, lucked out. I was just like, this is incredible. Can you imagine going into work every day and learning just an insane amount, like trying ingredients that you've never even heard of before in your life? And that happened every day for years. And it was just like, it was magical. I, I absolutely loved it. I think that most folks don't have a real sense of what true Mexican is. People need to also realize that Mexican food is super regional. I traveled throughout Mexico, went all over to different states and different regions. I was fortunate enough to have some really good friends from Cosme that would invite me to their family's home and show me the experiences that they grew up on, which is super impactful. In 2019, Thompson ventured to Vegas, first to Ilio at the Wynn, then taking on the helm of Casa Playa in 2021. Two years later and after the pandemic, the concept has taken off thanks to a team approach. Find your rhythm and give it a shake. When resort mixologist Mariana Mercer Borini put me to work behind yes, the bar. Absolutely. Roll it right there in some citrus juice and then just press it right in the salt. To create two of her specialties, the obsidian, Fresno chili infused tequila with cucumber and lime juice. Cocktail just very similar to culinary. It's all about so balance. So good. Symphony of flavors. Woo, and now it kicks. And the Temple of Doom. This one scares me. Mezcal with pineapple and ancho chili liqueur. Wow, oh, ooh. Wow. Oh my gosh, there were like four layers in there. How did you do that? You did it. <laughs> and with that, we launched into lunch. You like really do love color. It is a feast for the eyes. What is it that color brings to a dish? You eat with your eyes first. Everything needs to visually be very beautiful. And there's so many bright flavors and colors in Mexican cuisine. It's so easy to just showcase them and not have to alter them very much and just use the ingredients for what they are with a twist on some classics. Cut a little bit of pineapple, a little bit of pork belly, right into your tortilla and you get fresh El Pastor tacos off of your own trompo. That is decadent, that is sinful. Another Casa Playa staple, yellowfin tuna tartare with basilla chili, one of six raw fish preparations on the menu. Sarah, the flavor of this is like no crudo I've ever had. Campachi with carrot and sea buckthorn. Am I eating this with tortilla or without? However you want. It's gonna be good either way. A little bit of can cake I, at the end. Can I just live in it for a minute? A little bath in there, yeah. And the Branzino Zera Diedo. Juicy. 
It's a good fish taco, no? Hmm. Your reaction to this food is why I love being a chef. Watch this. You just seem so happy. I am happy. And that your face <laughs> of like just genuine, just liking this so much means everything. So thank I'm you. I'm so glad it means everything to you because it really means everything to me. For dessert, Chef Thompson's favorite, flan. I had to stop myself from eating it because they were putting it together earlier and they're like, oh, this is an extra piece. I was like, mm. no, I'm gonna eat it later. So I've been waiting for, for hours to eat this flan, okay? Mm. I beat ya. Mm. It's the back end of the taste. It, mm. It's wow. so good. And it's so smooth. And before we had to go, she even shared her secret ingredient. Philadelphia cream cheese. Shut up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It just, you know, you make a delicious custard, add some Philadelphia cream cheese, but it has to be Philadelphia. Mm. You're gonna dream about this. I do at least. It's my fave. I'm happy. Good. Mm. <sighs> All right, stay with us. We'll be right back to wrap things up. Making math fun. That was the goal of an event at Mississippi School for Math and Science earlier this week. The Math Superstar Science Carnival brings second and third graders to the MSMS campus. The high school students set up and perform science and math demonstrations for the younger students. The teachers say the carnival focuses on problem solving skills in a fun environment. I hope that it helps en engage and ignite the younger students interest in science. And for our students, it's very important to help them visualize themselves as leaders as they move into adulthood and that they see that science can also be entertaining. And MSMS hosts the Math Superstars Carnival every year in the fall. It looks like they had a lot of fun. We are out of time. We'll see you back here next time. Have a great day.